Welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and all across the 24-7 Sports Facebook network. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe. Smash that like. Come and join us in the chat getting interactive here on a Thursday where, yes, we are pulling questions from the five-star mail bag, that big old bag of mail, where if you leave us a five-star review and put your question in the review, we will tackle it in a future mailbag episode. And as always, those of you who are hanging out with us live, we appreciate you. We'll be taking some questions as well. Uh, some interesting conversation coming up a little bit later on. We'll be diving into the Big 12. We'll be looking at, you know, would you rather have an elite defensive line or a shutdown secondary? If you are a first-year defensive coordinator, how would you build your defense? Uh, and should college football rules be the same as the NFL? Is there a good argument one way or the other? We'll dive into all that, but let's start with uh, a early bird question because we got one from Jerry B. He came in early, 9.41 a.m. He said, in what order would you rank an undefeated Big 12, ACC, and Pac-12 champion for playoff purposes? Now, the way I'm interpreting this question is that, you know, I guess we could assume who it would be, but... You know, you are 12 and 0 coming from each of these conferences. How would you stack them up against each other? Ooh. I mean, if we're just going by conference strength, I would probably go Big 12. And then either I don't know, ACC or Pac 12 are pretty similar to me, honestly. Like it it depends what the team is and what the resume is. It's it's really hard to just judge off of that, but I think from top to bottom the average Big 12 team is better than the average Pac-12 and average ACC team. Nah, that's you bringing 2022 mindset to 2023. No, it's new, not. It's new, new additions are dragging the Big 12 down. <laughs> no, see, that's the thing. I don't. I think the new additions in the Big 12 are pretty on par with the bottom tier of the ACC and the Pac-12. I would go Pac-12 1, ACC 2, Big 12 3. I think. I would Unless have said that. But. Well, that's that's only because I think it's so dependent on the individual teams. Like if Florida State beats LSU, right. beats Florida, beats Clemson twice, you know, beats Miami, like all of a sudden that could be the most impressive undefeated from that team. But if it's USC and they run the table and let's say those those teams that are bringing like Washington, Oregon, uh, let's say Oregon State is good. Like, let's say all of a sudden some of those teams are really good in the Pac-12. Their resume might be the best. So it's so dependent on which team it is, I think. Also, I, Big 12 doesn't have round-robin schedule anymore. So you do have the, like, you know, the, you can get a good draw versus a bad draw in a way that you couldn't get before. I, I think if you based it on, like, the top four teams in each conference, the Pac-12 was probably first. But the thing is about the Pac-12 last year, like they had the teams that were ranked and then there was like a Pacific ocean sized gap between those teams and the rest of the league. Like the bottom of that league was really bad for the most part. I don't think you get that in the big 12. I think you have a couple teams like that in the ACC, but I don't think it's, it's closer from that point up than it is to the bottom. So I, I don't know. This is weird. Like if it's, if the question is an undefeated Clemson and undefeated Texas and undefeated USC, I don't know. Texas. Spend, yeah, probably, probably Texas based on their Alabama. schedule. Yeah. yeah. Um, the Notre Dame game for Clemson is going to be at home uh, as a win at Alabama, I think is going to clock out better. Also, Notre Dame might be eight and four. Yeah. That's true. I mean, what's their I, win total, right? Eight and a half, nine, nine and a half. Alabama might be eight and four. You know, Dynasty yeah. Island, Danny <laughs> Canoe. <True. laughs> he said it here first. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. We will continue to uh, to grab uh, questions from the chat all throughout the show. Uh, thank you to Jerry for jumping on in more than an hour before the show uh, to go ahead and contribute to that. A little bit of news since the last time we gathered together for a live show uh, is uh, probably one of the, the messiest uh, relationship breakup makeups that we have seen in recent conference realignment history. It's not going to get the, you know, the big headlines necessarily, but San Diego State, for those who, who are just catching up on this, they initially sent a letter that said, this is not our intention to leave, but this is our letter letting you know that we might be sending you a letter with an intention to leave. We just need a 30-day deadline on the intention to leave. 
Mountain West said, absolutely not. And then now the Mountain West is going to withhold $6.6 million from San Diego State because of these shenanigans. San Diego State came back and said, no, no, we're going to stay in the Mountain West. What, what, what's, what's the big takeaway here with the uh, Mountain West San Diego State relationship right now? San Diego State sleeping on the couch. I mean, this is, <laughs> yeah. they're staying together for the kids right now, but <laughs> San Diego State's being punished for its dalliances. I mean, they, uh, it's, it's so weird. It's dysfunctional. It's college football in a nutshell. I mean, they want to go to the Pac-12. I think the Pac-12 would probably ideally like to take them. But as we see in all these buyout situations, you know, they're trying to get the cheapest exit fee possible. And I think it's really awkward. I think Tom put it perfectly. Like It's like an awkward marriage that's on the rocks that everyone knows probably isn't going to make it. And so you are kicked to the curb. Like you're on the couch. Tom's 100% right. Oh, I've, I've got this uh, very similar. I'm going relationship. First of all, first uh, takeaway is the Pac-12 like might owe San Diego State $6.6 million. Y'all, y'all, y'all got to get this right, okay? Mm-hmm. Because if the Pac-12 had its media rights deal sewn up by now, then San Diego State might have been able to actually get out and feel confident and sell this thing and be able to make its move without having to deal with the awkwardness or the financial penalties. It seems to me like um, the side piece who is, you know, finding out like, oh, listen, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lever. I'm a lever for you. I promise. I promise. And then they go, show up to the airport and the ticket's not there. The PAC 12 did not leave the ticket for San Diego state. Now San Diego state had to go back home to San Diego to the mountain West and be like, Oh, I, I wasn't actually going to leave you. Come on, take me back. All because the PAC 12 didn't have its money together to be able to leave the ticket at the airport. I mean, it's, this is something that Pac-12 has got to get right with San Diego State in the future. So it's not quite as bad as Tiger Woods booking a vacation for his and girlfriend, and then not there's no vacation. You're just the locks are changed. It's not quite that bad. No, no, no. It's not quite that bad because you know San why Diego it's not State that bad? driving to any medians or fire hydrants. <laughs> the reason why it's not that bad is because no one actually has as much power or leverage like this. We're operating from a San Diego State Pac-12 Mountain West. We're operating with uh, not the same leverage that Tiger Woods has over uh, over his uh, girlfriends. All right, let's go back to. You know what's crazy though? On the whole Pac-12 fund, I mean, it's still in flux we have no like there's still no certainty i mean it still feels like there's a chance colorado utah arizona state arizona state could be to the big 12 like there's still these massive unknowns that are out there it's kind of wild that we're still not getting answers there was the other there was a new report yesterday like it might still be another month before the pac-12 has its tv deal and it's like every month it gets pushed another month well we're we're expecting it next month we're expecting it next month like i've been tweeting the I don't know. Did you guys ever have to read Waiting for Godot? Yeah. Okay. So I, I took the Waiting for Godot poster and I just replaced Godot with a Pac-12 TV deal and I keep tweeting it every time there's an update. But I mean, that's what it's like. We're all sitting there waiting for the Pac-12 TV deal that's never going to come. Is it? Is it going to be like a mostly streaming package where they're just farming out yes. a couple of games to linear television? Reading between the lines from what the the little updates that you get here and there, I do think that's what's going to be the case. Like there might be a ESPN game late night on Saturday, maybe on a Friday or a Thursday. But for the most part, I think probably three fourths of the league's games are going to be on a streaming service. And what happens to the Pac-12 network? <laughs> no one watches. It exist? I don't know. <laughs> Again, is it still on? Yes, I'm the old. How in the I, world? I have it. I have it. I've yeah. got eight Pac-12 networks. Okay? I only have one. <laughs> I've got Pac-12 network, Pac-12 network Bay Area, Pac-12 network Pacific Northwest, Pac-12 network Arizona. I've I've got so, Pac-12 network Mountain. I've got so many Pac-12 networks, and people in the Pac-12 footprint don't have the Pac-12 network. Chip's out here watching Washington State volleyball. <laughs> He's really into the Cougs this year. Listen, I... I there are times where somebody gets frustrated because a Pac-12 network game is getting preempted by something like that. Luckily, I've got eight Pac-12 networks. <laughs> <They're fine laughs> uh, all right, let's go to, oh, I like this beach wine guy. Uh, San Diego State is Ross from Friends. We were on a break. 
you know, trying to make an excuse from that. I never uh, watched Friends. Never? Mm-mm. I'm not going to make an argument for it. It was a, you know, cultural, you know, zeitgeist type thing. People are talking about it. Uh, this question is from Micah. What are your favorite college football books or resources that offer historical perspectives on the game or in-depth analysis of the schematics, generally trying to grow my knowledge of the game? Uh, I've got a couple AFCA coaching books that are helpful for learning some things, although the way the game changes. Yeah. And also the way the game changes, like a lot of the stuff in those books are more like an encyclopedia of stuff that people used to do. So it's it's really not the case of what's mostly updated now. But yeah, like coaching books like that, I think are helpful if you're trying to learn, like he says here, the uh, the in-depth analysis of its schematics. That's a good way to do it. If you just want historical perspective, like there's a lot of good books out there about the history of the game. I don't I mean there's uh what's the one about Mike by Michael Rosenberg? I think it's the. 10 year war about the Michigan Ohio State rivalry. That's a good one. There's plenty of them. Season of Saturdays. Season of Saturdays. Uh, one of my favorite college football books of all time still remains Bruce Feldman's Meat Market. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, honestly, that covers just... so many different bases, too. Mm-hmm. It's really good. Uh, yeah. The QB. QB's Bruce. Good. good. Yeah. I actually, you know what? Whatever. I'll just give him a plug here. Just, just read. Bruce's books. Yeah, Bruce has a lot of good books. They're <laughs> worth reading. That's probably a good good place oh. to start. He's got he's got good in depth analysis on on all that stuff. Our, our friend Bill Connolly, a frequent guest on the uh, on the Cover Three podcast, he's written a couple books as well. So uh, I would definitely turn your attention to any of those fine options. Your guys' bookcases are getting. Uh, if you guys want the fire escape plan here for the the <laughs> hotel I'm in, I can re- I can reference that. That is schematic. I do have books at home. Dang it, John, <laughs> John Feinstein's the uh, Civil War, the Army Navy book. That's pretty Ooh, good too. A history of the Army Navy rivalry. Hey, he's he is the preeminent uh, Army Navy uh, expert. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. Coming up on the other side, the question has been posed and will be answered. If you we're a newly hired defensive coordinator to Power 5 program, and you had to choose. Do you want the elite defensive line or the shutdown secondary? We'll get into that and more next. Someone hunted a hunter. This is the work of a serial killer. Pick things he can do a cop's job. Drop your weapon! Stand down! <laughs> No one trusts a lone man in a while. Joe Pickett Season 2 is now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Use promo code Pickett for one month free trial. Credit card required. Terms apply. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast. This comes from the big old bag of mail, where you can go and leave us a five-star review. And in that review, put your mailbag question. This comes from BVB Ruse. Hey guys, obligatory huge fan of the show. This question pertains to a philosophical debate on how to construct a defense that is often talked about in NFL circles. So, if you were a defensive coordinator newly hired at a Power 5 program, would you rather have an elite defensive line or a shutdown secondary to start your very first season? In today's game, is it more important to generate pressure or force the quarterback to make the right decision every time Thanks, y'all. As always, go Cox. Spurs up. I Easy. this go. Yeah, go. Uh, defensive line because they'll make an average secondary that much better. I think it's easy. I mean, look at the Philadelphia Eagles last year. Would they have eighty-five sacks on the season? Their secondary looked awesome because you only have to cover for two, two and a half seconds. You know, I mean, it's pretty simple. It, it doesn't matter how good of a corner you are. You could be Deion Sanders, but if you have to cover the guy for four to five seconds, eventually they're just going to get get loose. So yep. I think it's an easy question. I think it's always the defensive line. And yeah, there run, has. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say run defense too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, yeah. There's, I didn't think about that. Yep. There's been like a lot of debate lately about would you like this this question is it better to have the secondary or the defensive line i still think it's a defensive line because while i understand the thought process behind the secondary let's look at the team that's won the national title the last two years where's georgia's defense been the strongest and it's secondary or on its defensive line defensive because line. like kirby's entire defensive philosophy the way that they are is 
it's not so much about getting pressure on the quarterback, which is still very important in forcing the ball out, but it is stopping the run. And Kirby's philosophy is we're trying to stop the run with as few people as possible. So if you have a very good defensive line and you could do it just by having four guys and maybe a linebacker that, you know, like a Roquan Smith who flows to the ball after they plug all the gaps that allows you to leave six guys in coverage in case of an RPO where it's, you know, they hand off and they're passing. So I think still, no matter what, while it's great to have awesome players at all positions, I would much rather have the elite defensive line that can do anything I ask of it than a secondary. The question mentioned something about the NFL circles. It, there is a situation too, where I don't know. And, and I would actually like y'all's opinion on this. I don't know how many college football programs say that they have a truly elite full starting secondary. Very few. Like the, the, the number of like our both corners and both safeties, all of our, our whole starting secondary are, are dudes. It just seems so rare that you would be able to, to field that. I, I, I don't know if that's like a physical skill trait type thing, but that, that seems like a, a longer ask uh, in general when I'm trying to put this into practice right now and imagine the way that it's going to play out as this defensive coordinator. I mean, I, I think it comes down to like just kind of the simple truth that it is damn near impossible to play defensive back in football today because of the way the rules are and what you are and aren't allowed to do. Like, you know, at least in the defensive line, like the offensive lineman can't hold you, but you could kind of grab him and do whatever the hell you want with him. The defensive back can't do that. Like he's got to shadow and mirror the receiver who knows exactly where they're going at all times, whereas the defensive back has to react. So you're automatically on your back foot because of that to start. So, yeah, no, it's it's really hard to find an elite secondary all over because it's really hard to find elite defensive backs. Um, William in the chat makes a point. You'll see this in high school. A team will have D1 DBs but can't stop anyone because they're yeah. weak up front. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. This next question comes from Quagmire. He asks, this is the best podcast I listen to. I love how much effort you guys put in. <laughs> I love how much effort you guys put into this and hope this keeps up for a long time. With me being a diehard OU fan, I have a question. Of all the current Big 12 teams, who do you think will win a national championship next? Parentheses, this includes OU and UT when they go to the SEC. Thoughts on that? Keep up the good work. Hmm. I still think it's OU or UT. Even after they've left for the SEC. And I would probably at this point, go with ut because just because i feel like they've got a better sense of direction right now is where i think brent venables and that staff are still trying to implement their stuff at least i think i know where texas knows where it wants to go and is trying to get there but i just we know that being in the sec is probably going to provide not an easier path on the schedule but as far as selection as an at-large into the playoff it's probably going to get you a benefit of the doubt more times than not and I think that if you just look at, you know, Bud's not here, but if you look at the blue chip ratio and what we have seen from what you need to do to recruit to win national titles, Texas and Oklahoma are the only two Big 12 teams currently recruiting at that level. So maybe TCU or, S or SMU, maybe TCU or these other schools level up in the next few years, but right now they're not there, whereas Texas and Oklahoma already are. So I would have to go with one of those two, and I'd slightly lean Texas right now. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, Oklahoma... Texas, if you get three teams in, which is probably what I think they'll get in from the, you know, mm -hmm. the 12 team expanded playoff. And, you know, if you're going to take one of those two, I think you probably lean Texas quarterback looks like it's stacked up really well. Yeah. And we've seen them play a little bit better. I know Jackson Arnold's supposed to be really good. But we haven't seen him play yet. Recruiting rankings been a little bit stronger for Texas. Now, if you had an Oklahoma fan would say, well, they've always had it, you know, and they haven't been able to come to fruition yet, which is totally valid. Um, but I'd lean slightly towards Texas, but not by a lot. But I think it's clear. I think it's pretty easy that it's Oklahoma, Texas, and no consideration for anyone who's left in the Big Twelve of the future. I just this comes back to the thing I've been harping on all along. Like you're going to have to win three games. The question but, is national championship too, right? National mm -hmm. championship. Yeah, yeah. You're going to have to win three games at a minimum. But we saw T TCU is the perfect example because we saw him win one, and it was a good win. And then we saw like what, and I don't think they get blown out every time like that, but Georgia, but you saw what would, you know, what can happen. And, you know, if they play them 10 times, do they win one or two? Yeah. 
Right. But that's probably about it, right? But was, I think they I think they lose by 20 plus more often than they win. Right. Was it 14-7 late first quarter TCU with the ball and you kind of had like an inkling and then maybe it was like a turnover or turnover on downs. I like there some of these national championship games with lopsided final scores, you can go back and find that moment when you were the sitting there and you were like, wait, is it, are they going to be able to like get back in this thing? Oh, no, 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 mm -hmm. they're not. When it spun out of control uh, very, very quickly. Uh, we Again, we appreciate everybody in the live audience. Let's head on back to some of our live chat questions. Uh, this next one comes from Joel. Joel H. Cooper says, which teams will surprise in September and fade in October, November? Who will start slow and finish strong? Then who will start slow and finish strong but contend for a conference title? Florida and Kansas State. I guess he means Florida State, surprise, bad finish. Kansas State, slow start, good finish come to mind from 2022. It's hard to say really without the schedules in front of you, but... Um, so like he's asking for like a Kansas or an Illinois. Yeah, Kansas cause... jumps out to five and zero, oh, hits nineteen in the country. Then all of a sudden, it gets really tough to get that sixth win to make mm -hmm. the bowl season for the first time since two thousand eight. Yeah, Illinois started seven one, finished eight and five. So it's I don't know. Tar, um, tar holes start nine and one, finish nine and five. Hole. You know, we talked about him a little bit. I think that the way their schedule sets up. Minnesota is a team, especially with a new quarterback that could get off to a very slow start, but maybe kind of find its way as the year goes along and starts pulling off some wins. So I would say Minnesota could be that kind of slow start, strong finish team. But as far as like, like Louisville is a team to me that could start really hot and then suffer an injury or two and completely crumble down the stretch. Yeah, we're all calling for a nine and three Louisville team, but they got like 30 some odd newcomers on that mm -hmm. team, 25 transfers. If a couple Jamari Thrash goes down with an injury, Jack Plummer gets hurt, all of a sudden things start to to pile up on them. The beginning of the schedule is really easy. Um, I, I I definitely think I could rock with that. I'm trying to find what about Colorado? Option. No, That's they're gonna start, start slow. They're gonna I think they're That's one and five to start. That's that, a slow that would start be the, and a strong finish. I mean, because that's where I'm good. Like, I am painting a picture. My most optimistic Colorado season is that Deion Sanders actually instills some resiliency and some resolve in that locker room. They start slow and then they get a couple because there are winnable games on the back end of that schedule. And then you're able to go into the offseason being like, yeah, we were four and eight, but look at the way we were playing at the end of the season. We won, you know, three of our, you know, half of our, back half of the season games we beat this team this team and this team and now we're going to go out and we're going to you know go get more players like that the way that that colorado season is set up is going to be the perfect test for the Deion sanders experiment because it is going to be on him to truly be able to keep that locker room together through what's going to be a brutal start to the schedule dustin black has a good candidate in the comments like michigan if you look at its first nine games, will probably be nine to zero and winning by an average of seventeen points per game. But then their last three games are at Penn State, at Maryland, Ohio State. Now I think Michigan's probably a little too good to really kind of be the team that you know blows it up down the end. But that is a very tough finish compared to what they start with. You know who was this team last year? Start strong, limp in was North Carolina. And I was mm -hmm. looking at North Carolina's schedule this year to see. I mean, I could see them beating South Carolina beating Minnesota at home, maybe beating Pitt, getting through Syracuse, maybe even getting to the back end of their schedule, but they go on the road to Clemson, NC State to finish the year. You could see them maybe finish limping in again like they did last year. Um, I was trying to think of candidates. A lot of it does. I remember Mississippi State used to always be that team from the end. And this one member, they got up to one. I mean, didn't they start the first uh, college football playoff? Weren't they the you know the number one team? And they were like six or seven and oh, and they really hadn't played anybody out of conference had played the weaker teams in the sec and they were sitting there and then they would just collapse on the back end. It is. There's always a couple teams that start like that. Ole Miss got up to top 10 in the country with a, a little bit of a hot start. Um, and like for the record, like if a, a true analysis, I said that I was painting the most optimistic scenario for Colorado. 
a, a cold blooded analysis. My opinion on the buffs is that they are severely underserved along the lines of scrimmage. And that's mm -hmm. problematic in the game of football, but you know. here's another one. If you want it, mm -hmm. Texas A&M's first five games, mm -hmm. New Mexico, at Miami, if they win that one, that's kind of like, a, you know, ooh, look, oh, look, here they come. Bobby Petrino's galloping. There <laughs> yep. come the Aggies. Yep. Then it's UL Monroe at home versus Auburn on the road versus Arkansas. So that's a team. If they get off to 5-0 and start, you know they're going to be in the top 10 of both the polls Easily. setting up for that home game against Alabama on October 7th where they lose by 24. And then <laughs> they go on the road to Tennessee and they lose by 14. And then, yeah, so Texas A&M. Uh, that's a great job. one. Mm -hmm. That's a good call. Isn't that like a Texas A&M rite of passage too? It's usually, you know? Yeah, yeah. September is like, what was the old, what was that website it was called? It was someone. It was or whatever. It would be like, it would like September, this, the roller coaster goes up and then October is the very top and it just falls straight off. Yeah, that was, that was the Kevin Sumlin special right there. Because again, Jimbo Fisher is just inflation era Kevin Sumlin. You're just paying more for the exact same results. <laughs> Uh, we have a good, that was a good one in the chat. Uh, Andrew Syracuse, they could start out Ooh. rough. I mean, they, so not Colgate West Michigan, they go at Purdue army could be a tricky game. Clemson at North Carolina at Florida state. And then they go on the road to Virginia tech. They may, maybe they win that one and kind of get things back on track. And then you could be like, Oh, it wasn't, but you know, I could see after a rough start, it's like, oh, is Dino on the hot seat? You know, like one of those conversations. But I could see them not being as bad as people maybe think they, they were are. were sneaky limp to the finish last yeah. year. Yeah. A ton of injury issues. Like they, there's context that needs to be applied. But yeah. they were 6-0, right, when they played Clemson? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they uh, they got off to a, a little bit of a hot start there. We have, we have mentioned Army twice on the show now. And I've gotten it brought up to me many times. I haven't talked about it on the show, but I, I, I will address it. We do know Army's no longer has fullbacks, right? Army is changing its offense this year. Yes. Jeff and, Monken is going to be running yeah. out of the shotgun. We will still mm -hmm. have option principles. It's going to be more it's Coastal carolina coastal. Yeah. But I just want, because I've had a lot of listeners ask me for my thoughts about it with the Service Academy Unders principle and all that stuff. And it's like, I'm still trying to stay in denial about the fact that <laughs> we are going to be losing another option offense and that it's just going to be Navy and Air Force left. So we'll cross that bridge when we come to it until then I'm just pretending it's not happening. You're just going to ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's all, maybe it's all just a fake. Maybe army's going to show up in that very first game. And they're just going to be running out of the, running out of the triple option. Like always we'll see. Fingers crossed. What's have we, uh, have we had a, without a quarterback change, have we had a college football program recently just throw out its offense and revert <laughs> back to something else in the middle of the season? I've seen it with the quarterback change, right? Where you just, you, yeah. somebody gets mm -hmm. hurt, you bring in a new quarterback, we're going to run an entirely new offense. Mm -hmm. But I can't, I can't think of. <laughs> we've <laughs> seen, we've seen firings mid, you know, I was Boise, Boise State last year comes to mind. They fired their OC and then brought in, they brought in Dirk Cutter, right? Wasn't that who they brought yeah, in? Maybe. Kind of, but they, I don't think they revamped everything. That was a pretty drastic shift. We haven't seen just an offense thrown out. Just totally like all of a sudden Jeff Monken doesn't like what he sees. Right. Again, eating alive on the inside. It's like we're going back to the bread and butter, baby, is what we're doing. Then all of a sudden we see him back under center and the unders keep cashing again. Coming up on the other side, a lot of talk about uh, you know, the the game rules, especially because remember, clock rules change this year in college football. So is there a good argument for or against having all of the college football game rules be exactly the same as the NFL? We'll get into that and more next. They say patience is a virtue, but for some things, we can't wait. I really like if that. They say patience is a virtue. Actually, it would make me wait a little longer. Pull this question up. <laughs> Come on, we're trying to take a break here, folks. Well, we're trying to take a break here. All Five right. seconds. What is this, like a YouTube ad? Skip ads. <laughs> this question comes from the big old bag of mail. It's from a user, Albert's Life Coach. And Albert's Life Coach asks, question for the mailbag. Is there a good argument for or against having the college football game rules be exactly the same as NFL? 
Since college football is essentially a feeder league for the NFL, wouldn't it be just like minor league baseball rules being the same as major league baseball rules? Wouldn't the game be better with ties? I don't know. Um, I don't understand that last part. Let's forget. Let's throw out that last part. I, I was I like gonna say the- I love college overtime. Don't get don't get rid of that. I can't stand the NFL overtime. I think they should ad- adopt college football overtime. Mm-hmm. But some sort so of we are going to have clock rules where the clock is going to run after a first down and mm-hmm. it's going to happen this season and it's going to make games a little bit shorter and it's going to change some of the approach so in the last two minutes of each half the clock will stop after first downs so you've still got you know the the crunch time situation is still going to be there the hash marks come to mind for me as well as another you know thing that probably falls into the folder of the rules and so i don't know what, what is there a good argument for or against i like that he said either one way or the other is there a strong argument for aligning the rules of nfl and college i think there's a stronger argument against it than there is for it i do too like if if your goal is to have players quote unquote adjust to the NFL quicker then that's your argument for it but other than that I don't really understand what the argument for it is and also last I checked they don't really have that much difficulty adjusting to the NFL rules because they're all pretty much the same these are like tell these are like television rules let's be honest it's it's not really game rules um I don't know I I I want to keep the sports as different as possible I don't want it to be a minor league NFL I mean look at college basketball in the NBA College basketball doesn't play by the same rules the NBA does. That has an effect that, you know, it doesn't keep basketball players from learning how to play in the NBA. So, no, I don't think there's any need for it. I wouldn't be opposed. I wouldn't. I'm not as opposed to it as you guys are. Um, I think the NFL, it is a faster game. It's easier to watch, like you said, for TV. I mean, they have it pretty dialed down to the three-hour and 15-minute time window. I also feel like it just moves faster. But you also have guys who have unlimited time to work and prepare and then they're not as confused. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes you need a little extra time in between plays and to slow things down a little bit for guys that are you only have 20 hours a week uh, to kind of prep. So it doesn't like it's not something I wouldn't be that upset if they kind of adopted more NFL rules. I still think the talent on the field is enough disparity between college and the NFL, but I don't. Like, I don't hate it the way it is. There are a couple of rules I wish the NFL would adopt from college. One is instead of two feet, just one foot for a catch. Mm-hmm. Although the NFL receivers are so damn good at it. That it <laughs> almost doesn't catch matter. Everything. Yeah. But the other is I don't like the one thing I do like about college compared to the NFL just that I always have is you don't have to touch a guy down. If you fall down, plays over. Yeah. 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 You shouldn't be able to get back up and keep running. If somebody, also, yeah. yeah. College football, uh, college football pass interference over NFL pass interference. Oh, for sure. Like that's well, get so, rid of pass interference altogether. Uh, yeah, no blood, no pass interference, of course. But it, so I am of the mindset that some of the college football rules allow regular dudes and regular teams to still be competitive mm-hmm. and that if you change the rules to make it more like NFL, that is even going to be yet another separation of the haves and the have-nots and the talent Great discrepancy point. that like if you bring in the hash marks then the schools that don't have the height, weight, and speed and are able to scheme guys open, they're not going to be able to do that anymore. And if we introduce the pass interference at the spot of the penalty, then all these bad DBs that are trying to keep up with NFL wide receivers are going to end up having game-changing plays. And college football has 133 teams. There's a lot of regular, great, there's a lot of regular college football players that I have a great time watching on Saturdays. And I think that the competition would create even more separation if we go to NFL rules. I think that's a great point. Because it's fun, right? We're just trying to have fun around here. Let's go. Uh, let's go to question from the live chat from Kyle. Kyle Wallace asks, who are your all-time favorite sicko teams to watch 2022 iowa was an (laughs) all-timer who else should be included i mean san diego state in a year yes like 
there was there for years i know danny i don't know if you were part of this but chip and i were definitely san diego state unders auto fire at the end of the night no matter what was happening that day because you knew it was going to be ugly and rocky and very much iowa-ish like to kind of go along with what the kind of thing kyle's talking about so yeah san diego state games uh I love option offenses. So, I mean, like any service academy game for me has always been great. Going back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago. How do you define like, Mark? Mark had a good question uh, or Fox did. How do you define a sicko team? I A sicko team is not something that I'm going to be able to sell. Um, like, yeah, you can't take this team to a casual and say, enjoy the beauty of yeah, college yeah, yeah, football. Yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not putting this on the deck. To take it to the investors meeting. I'm not <laughs> going to be able to use this to sell college football, uh, but this is just the, this is, it's, it's the, you want to see a dead body kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that, yeah, it's if San Diego state certainly comes to mind pretty much in a year, all time favorite sicko teams. I mean, there were, the Chucky Keaton Utah State teams. Mm. UConn and UMass are fun oh, sometimes. Sometimes. Say so, yeah. All right. So Nebraska is not a sicko team. That's just that. That is watching a train crash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, watching the blown leads and the losses and the one score games, especially when they started to pile it up. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Parker. TCU Cal Cheese at Bowl. Yep. It's like 13 sicko combined. Game of all time. Yeah, yeah, 13 combined interceptions. It's like seven to six final score. Um the three two awesome. Mississippi State Auburn game. Yeah. What's Virginia the one the take Beamer? Wake? Was that yeah. zero zero? Was zero it? zero. <laughs> <laughs> Those are sicko Hall of Fame games. Yeah. I enjoyed, you know, it's a sicko game. I think it counts. I enjoyed last year's Oregon State Florida game. I thought that was a sicko <laughs> game because that was just go for the field goal. Yes. The sad field yeah. goal at the end just sealed it as a sicko game because that's what everybody was watching for. It was like, will Florida score points? What are they going to do? That was an actual news writing assignment for me on that day. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Chip, we got a potential breaking news story for you. Oh, yeah. What is it? If Florida doesn't score a point here, <laughs> <they're> gonna, <laughs> the NCAA record is coming down. And we're going to need to talk about it. Gross. Sue has a good one. I, I'll, I'll get a little more specific, though. Northwestern in the red zone. <laughs> That's a great sicko team to watch. Um, yeah. That, again, that some I, I would say something that you would never use to try to sell college football to somebody who hasn't watched it before. But if you've been in it for a long time, you can find mm -hmm. appreciation for it. Um, Danny, I know you wanted it uh last week do you have your list of strength coaches still <laughs> that's right i had let's see i had some notes on this one too uh you had to go up there was the tcu strength coach oh Kaz. coach Cass. yeah yeah just for his uh the amount of references he got getting you uh tcu to the uh to the final four and getting them to the championship game I gotta pull up my list. I do there think are. it's the most important position outside of coordinators, especially when you think about the growth that takes place from being a freshman to a you know sophomore. Those yeah. first two years, you can add so much. You've never really been in a you know very serious you know uh, weight program, strength program, nutrition program. And that's usually that guy's job, like all encompassing. And don't they also spend? Like more arguably time more yeah. time. Oh yeah, for sure. With yeah, the players, get way the more time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, D'Antonio Burnett at NC State, right here in my backyard. Like that guy is taking tight ends and turn them into NFL offensive linemen. I mean, he is just he is built up. The player development at Dave Doran's program has been thanks in part to what they are doing in in getting people right along the lines of scrimmage, and that's a big part of what they do. Yeah, I would say if there's any aspect of this sport that has like taken huge strides in the last decade, like the stuff that we think about, I would say the strength programs at every single one of these schools, like overall, like I think strength coaches across the country are just a lot better and more understanding of what it takes to, you know, not just make a guy strong, but to make them 
able to play football and to help keep them healthy while doing it. I think there have been major strides in that aspect in recent years. Totally agree. Um, both college and NFL, like mm -hmm. both of them. I remember there was a strength coach when I got my rookie year in the NFL, and our our strength coach was a super nice guy at Florida State, but he was just kind of your traditional, you know, strength coach. It wasn't You're just doing push ups. How much you max it, boy? <laughs> I but I mean, it was. I mean, it was not very innovative, and I loved him. Like he was awesome, but I also was kind of lazy, and I didn't want to work that hard, so it kind of <laughs> worked out pretty well. But when I went to the NFL, this guy was big on Olympic lifts, and I was getting so frustrated because we're doing like snatches and cleans and all these like overhead, and I'm like, why do I? And I'm doing him next to an offensive lineman or a defensive tackle, and we're doing the same things. And yes. I'm like what is happening right here and now i think the specialization of you know by position by body type i mean they study or you know they'll take blood tests they'll do so much more to try to maximize your just you know your body and your body type mm -hmm. that it's it's really been revolutionized over the last 15 years yeah for a long time it was mostly like strength coaches were just like bodybuilding and weightlifting it's like yeah we're and gonna yellers. make you look huge yeah, yeah. And motivators it's like, well, no, like no. yellers yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and now yeah. it's like well actually you know flexibility is more important than overall you know so it's yeah wasn't um nebraska on the forefront of like the strength program and that's you of, mean steroids yeah. sure yeah <laughs> are you referencing johnny b good are you referencing the movie with anthony michael hall when he goes to nebraska and they walk through there and there's all the guys that are like taking ivs and injections and it's like a lab that was a great no, movie, somebody, by the way. Somebody was making a point that the first run in like the 70s had came at a time where like the strength program was just push-ups and pull-ups at a lot of places. <laughs> yep. And then right. Nebraska was like, hey, here are paint cans. Like, you know, like we're gonna be <laughs> we're gonna be putting on some real muscle. We're just gonna mash you boys. And then like that's kind of uh where things took off. I could be very wrong, but I heard it referenced recently and uh yeah it was the paint cans at nebraska yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that was the difference <laughs> um just strength strength coaches are huge and you know it's uh it continues to evolve uh, all the way through um you know i i don't know if you guys have uh have checked the calendar recently but uh there's there's something that's uh, something that's count them up there's something that's coming <laughs> count them up S something's cut Oh, that's right. We got win totals coming up, baby. Monday, July 10th. We are going to be back. Win totals season starts. That means we are going through all the Power 5 conferences, and we are going to be breaking down the win total for every single school. Then, at the very end of the series, right before the season starts, our win total locks episode. So, come join us. Come hang out. We're starting with the Pac-12 on Monday to ask the question everybody's asking. How many games are going to win this fall? And you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernell. You can follow him at Danny Cannell. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.